My name is uh, Katie Abizar, and I'm the Vice President and our Autoantibody Disease Area and Maternal Fetal Immunology Disease Area Leader at Johnson & Johnson. So I work in R&D in our Johnson & Johnson Innovative Medicine Organization. Um, in that role, I have the privilege of leading um, all of our autoantibody programs, including one of our investigational assets called Nefocalumab. Um, very briefly, by way of background, I'm a physician by training, um, and I've been at Johnson & Johnson for about five years. And although the accent wouldn't um, give it away, I do actually live in the Philadelphia area. So myasthenia gravis, um, and specifically generalized myasthenia gravis, which is the more extensive sort of systemic kind. There's also ocular myasthenia gravis, for example. What is it? Well, the symptoms are that it, your character is characterized by fluctuating weakness of the skeletal muscles. And in generalized myasthenia gravis, that will also include the muscles that allow you to speak and swallow. And so as you can imagine, if you have weakness of these, it can have pretty devastating consequences on your quality of life and ultimately result in morbidity and mortality even. Um, it's actual underlying cause, like why are your muscles have fluctuating weakness, is it's autoantibody driven, which means that instead of having antibodies, IgG antibodies in your body that are attacking viruses or bacteria, they're actually coming after your own body and causing this. And in myasthenia, there are at least three known autoantibodies. Uh, the two most common attack your acetylcholine receptor and your muscle tyrosine kinase, so ACHR and musk, and they cause this fluctuating weakness of your skeletal muscles. I will also say myasthenia, you know, it's a lifelong disease. It doesn't go away once you have it. You, tend to, you will always have it. So it is chronic. Um, so yes, it's rare, but um, it's really got devastating consequences for people who live with generalized myasthenia gravis. Historically, in this space, um, people have used what was available to them, so broad conventional treatments that are immunosuppressant, not selective for any of the underlying cause, things like oral corticosteroids. And along with those come safety and tolerability challenges. Um, more recently, there has been progress, which is really exciting. And so, you know, there are complement inhibitors that are approved, although they only cover a subset of patients, so anti-ACH are positive general myasthenia gravis patients. Um, but so research has moved on to look at mechanisms that might take to target the underlying cause, these autoantibodies that I've talked about. And there's been research looking at FCRN blockers. So FCRN, it's a mouthful, it stands for uh, the crystallizable fragment neonatal receptor has neonatal in the name because it was actually first described in the syncytiotrophoblasts in the placenta. We call it the FCRN receptor. And FCRN blockers do have the potential to address the underlying cause of myasthenia by reducing these autoantibodies out of circulation. So a much more sort of selective approach. Two of them are approved. You know, between them, they don't cover all the seropositive patients or provide sustained disease control in what is actually a really lifelong condition. Um, you know, in the, in the current dosing paradigm, it's cyclical. Um, and that does leave practitioners and patients with a lot of uncertainty in what is really a very chronic, lifelong disease. So unmet need does remain for these patients for something very immune selective that covers a broad population and that is offering something sustained in this lifelong disease. So there's been a lot of progress, which is really exciting. There is still more to come, more to go. Nipocalumab is our investigational therapy, and it is an FCRN blocker, as I described. So um, nipocalumab is a very high affinity and specificity, which I can come back to later. Um, it's fully human, it's aglycosylated, it's effectless, what does that all that really mean? It means that this is a monoclonal antibody that very selectively and specifically blocks the FCRN receptor. So when you block the FCRN receptor, what are you doing? You're preventing it from recycling IgG antibodies, including your autoantibodies. 
If you're not recycling them, they reduce very significantly out of circulation, which means that the underlying cause of what's damaging your muscles in myasthenia is no longer circulating at the sufficient levels to cause the disease in your blood. Actually, we also, it also has another mechanism. And I mentioned earlier with a little bit of a teaser the word neonatal, it was discovered in the placenta first, first described in the placenta. So in pregnant individuals, the FCRN has the job of transporting IgG across the placenta from mum to baby. And there are diseases as well of pregnancy where we call them alloantibodies, but pathogenic antibodies cross from mum to baby and cause damage in the baby. And so also in pregnancy, it has this potential to reduce those and therefore potentially transform these disease states. Um, so with this mechanism, you could potentially imagine this target, this mechanism targeting anything that's auto or alloantibody allo driven. That's quite a lot of diseases, maybe 80 in the literature. So we think about them in three segments in the autoantibody world. Um, those like myasthenia that are rare, directly autoantibody driven diseases, where you have some known autoantibodies that cause a known disease, exactly like we were just discussing with myasthenia, with anti-ACHR and anti-musk antibodies, for example. You also have the alloimmune diseases of pregnancy. They're also rare, that the unmet need is immense. Whereas I described what you'd be doing by blocking the FCRN is stopping alloantibodies from crossing to mum harming baby and um, things like hemolytic disease of the fetus and newborn. And then finally, you have diseases in, that are much more common in the prevalent rheumatology space, things like Sjogren's disease, for example, also anti autoantibody driven. Um, so with this mechanism, there are so many diseases that you go after. We think about them in these three segments. And actually, we are excited to say about nifcalumab, and you may have seen that in the last year, we've shown clinical effects across all three of these segments in four diseases, hemolytic disease of the fetus and newborn, myasthenia, which is the one that we were talking about today, Sjogren's disease, as well as rheumatoid arthritis. So actually, we... We talked about a couple of things, you know, there was this, um, one of the things that we wanted to talk about was the molecular differentiation of nepocalumab. Because if you think about an, uh, an FCRN blocker, what you're really looking for it to do is to bind very tightly to the FCRN receptor. And we, you'd ideally like it to do that independent of the acidity or the pH of, of when it binds. So what we've been able to show is that nepocalumab binds very, very tightly independent of pH, and that's important particularly for the maternal fetal immunology indications. You also would like it to bind very specifically to the appropriate IgG binding site of the f right? and that's really important. And the preclinical and some clinical data that we've been looking at recently is what we describe in the molecular differentiation abstract that we submitted to a AAN. And so um, those are preclinical and some clinical studies. Um, recently, we have also uh, released top line findings from our phase three study in generalized myasthenia gravis. It's a study called Vivacity. Um, and that, uh, in that, our primary endpoint, we showed a statistically significant reduction in your myasthenia gravis ADL, which stands for activities of daily living score from baseline over weeks 22 to 24 compared with placebo. And then we've also previously announced results from the phase two study that also showed that patients who received nepocalumab had a greater clinical response compared with placebo. Um, and we've also been able to show that, so if I take you back to the mechanism, we were talking about what does the FCRN blockage do? And it reduces autoantibodies, so IgG autoantibodies from circulation. One of the things that in the space you'll hear us talk about is, well, how much do you reduce it? How much do you reduce IgG from circulation as a way of also measuring um, the, the sort of effect, the PD effect of an FCRM blocker like nepocalumab? And we're able to show that nepocalumab has rapid, deep and sustained over a period of time reduction in IgG and therefore also autoantibodies that cause this, the underlying cause of these diseases. Um, so we've been bringing all of that together and we think that it's also so important in terms of what we're able to take forward on this program 
not only for patients living with rare autoantibody diseases like myasthenia gravis, but also beyond and on the road. Well, as you have seen, we're in, we're in development in a number of different indications across all three of these segments, which is really unique to Nipigalumab, to our investigational therapy. Um, we continue to have so much passion and belief and confidence in the program. And of course, our next step is to bring Nipigalumab to patients through discussions with regulators about potential approvals, um, starting with generalized myasthenia gravis. Um, but as I said, really, with the unique attributes of the molecule, we're able to go to even more patients living with auto and alloantibody driven diseases. So for example, moving into the maternal fetal immunology segment, we have commenced a phase three program in hemolytic disease of the fetus and newborn, building off our recent data. And we're also really excited about what are in the prevalent rheumatology segment, what our recent data in um, Sjogren's disease mean for patients, which is, you know, an indication with no approved advanced therapies beyond sort of potential traditional immunosuppressants like I described way back at the beginning. So we're hoping to be able to really make a difference in the lives of patients living with these diseases. I mean, I think I'd be re remiss if I didn't just um, emphasize the commitment and the work and the effort of everyone who works on these programs and are so dedicated to bringing these medicines to patients and addressing unmet needs. You know, we partner bringing our expertise in neuroscience and immunology and immune-mediated disease, and really the teams work tirelessly in pursuit of, um, in pursuit of innovative therapies to address patients' unmet needs, and I'd love to do a shout out to the teams for everything they do. I'm here representing. <laughs>